We will start with Jose Morel. Uh, Jose is an independent consultant and he's the founder of the Top Statement Practice, which is based in Mauritius. Uh, Jose has been working in the area of debt management for over 25 years, and he has wide international experience gained in over 50 countries. Uh, Jose has spent much of his career at the Commonwealth Secretariat in London from 87 to 2013, and he has various, various positions, uh, both technical and negative. Um, and when he left the Commonwealth Secretary, he was the Director of the Special Advisory Services Division. So Jose is a dentist with different different uh, including obviously the CSP. Uh, so I pass the floor to Jose, hoping that you know, this sounds like quality will improve. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Chidam, uh, and a very warm welcome to all participants. I'm talking to you from Port Louis, uh, the capital of Mauritius, and I hope you can hear me uh, over the noise. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the World Bank for inviting me to speak uh, at this event. My presentation is going to focus on four aspects of uh, debt management information systems, or DIMIS. We will first look at the role and importance of DIMIS. We will look at the core functionalities that countries should look for when considering uh, a debt management information system. Attributes of an efficient DMIS will be the third point we will be talking about. And finally, uh, DMIS implementation in countries. We'll have a look at this and also try to answer a few frequently asked questions. From a generic point of view, the role of any computerized management information system is really to support and facilitate business activities so that managers are able to make operational and strategic decisions efficiently. And if you were to take a management information systems uh, 101 course, you would be introduced to this very simple diagram and framework, which is supposed to represent uh, a management information system. And basically, this is what an MIS does. It provides for the collection of data and storage of data in database. This data can then be processed, sorted, and, ma and manipulated in various ways, and the result produced as output. I think the important point to note here is that at the data or input stage, we are really talking about raw data a transaction or an exchange rate. But at the output stage, we are looking at reports, a set of debt ratios, cost risk indicators, or graph. And this is then the role of the MIS is to convert this raw output into, uh, raw input, sorry, into information. In the context of public debt management, this means supporting front, middle, and back office functions from debt negotiations, administering debt service, reporting, right through the elaboration and implementation of debt management strategies. Therefore, and I think everybody will agree with me, a well-functioning debt management information system is crucial, really, for the effective, for effective public management. Let's have a look at the DIMIS. Now, the debt management information system will really be the backbone of debt management operations in the office. And I'm going to use the same little framework which I've introduced to you to look at the core functionality of a DIMIS. Please note here that I'm really simplifying and um, trying to look at the high level uh, functions. The gray boxes represent the input into the system. And really, the, the, the core functionality here is for the DIMIS to be able to maintain an, in, an inventory of all the external and domestic debt instruments and their relevant characteristics. You will notice that I've underlined the word all, because as you know in debt management, it is very important that you do not have gaps in your database. This situation of having gaps will mean effectively that some instruments will be 
computerized using maybe Excel spreadsheet, and then the output has to be added manually to the reports of a DMIS. Of a DMIS. And this really defeats, I think, it's very cumbersome, it's error prone, and defeats the purpose of using a management information system in the first place. The second box of, uh, which is here, I've highlighted transaction by transaction basis. I'm often asked whether a, management, a, a DMIS could uh, collect data in an aggregate, aggregate way. In my view, the answer is no. You really need to collect data transaction by transaction. On the processing side, of course, the DMIS will then compute your debt stocks and flows, and it will be able to do so for any aggregation period, whether on a daily basis, monthly, quarterly, annual, fiscal year, and so forth. And the DMIS should also have some facilities to manage restructuring and the use of derivatives for those countries uh, with uh, engaging in active debt management. And we, we, we can probably talk about this topic a little bit later on. And all of this has to be done according to international debt data compilation standards. And I'm thinking here of the IMF, public sector, and external uh, debt statistics guide. The output side, of course, is vital. And here, I've distinguished between reporting and data exchange. Uh, some DMIS tend to mix the two together. I think this is conceptually wrong. And a DMIS should have a set of reports, standard reports, to meet the day-to-day -day requirements of a debt office. But it should also provide a facility to, for users to write customized report. And this sometimes can be done either through wizards or through uh, off-the-shelf commercial uh, report writers. And um, also uh, a facility for saving uh, outputs into Excel for man further manipulation, uh, for graphics and so forth is, is, is quite useful. In fact, quite necessary as well. On the data exchange side, and you will see later in my presentation the importance of data exchange, uh, the DMIS should allow the user to exchange data, either import or export data to other systems, uh, such as domestic debt system, which I'll talk about a bit later on, analytical tools such as the DSA template, MTDS, or reporting platforms like the World Bank Debt Reporter System, Data Reporter System, the IMF SDDS, GGDS, and so forth, and to other applications. Should a DMIS uh, embed some analytical tools? Uh, in my view, yes. Uh, I think if you look at the functions of the debt office, you will find that be uh, besides the kind of analysis that you will undertake in specialized packages like MTDS, there is a need to, for example, evaluate different loan options or test the impact of new borrowings based on different scenarios. And it is convenient if the DMIS can provide such a facility because this is really a function of the front office with the help of a middle office. So a, a respectable DMIS, to put it this way, should provide some analytical tools uh, such as the ones listed uh, on, on uh, the presentation here. And finally, uh, I think uh, two important aspects is the whole management of user and database access, user logins and passwords, audit trails, the facilities to take backup and restore and all that. These are facilities usually provided by the debt management system uh, or the database product, which will be uh, at the core of a DMIS. But um, usually a DMIS will have an additional layer on top of these four facilities. You will see the, green, uh, the um, gray box here. We have added validation tools to ensure database integrity and accuracy. What will distinguish a DMIS from any other management information system is that a DMIS should be intelligent and know a little bit about public debt management. So in computing, for example, uh, DOD or interest rate, if the interest rate is negative, the DMIS should know that it's not usually possible to pay negative interest rate to a creditor 
and should flag it as an error. So built into the DIMIST, there should be a whole body of knowledge which is um, included and which helps the debt manager uh, compute the debt data statistics. So this is the DIMIS on its own, but to support the entire debt management operations in a country, uh, a DIMIS will not be sufficient. In the corporate sector, you usually have ERPs, as you know, enterprise resource uh, programs, which allow uh, um, companies to manage from HR, stock control, inventory, accounting, and so forth in one package. Here, the DIMIS will have to talk to other subsystems. And one good example is the domestic debt subsystem. Developing the domestic debt market, as you know, is a, a, a major objective of debt management strategies. And although countries with embryonic domestic debt markets usually start off doing auctioning using the spreadsheet, very soon they will need to, to acquire an auctioning system uh, for, for issuing domestic debt securities. And probably uh, coupled with an online bidding system, so that primary dealers or, or registered market makers are, ab are able to submit their bids electronically. Uh, with the dematerialization of government securities, the CDS, so Central Depository System, will also become important. And as the secondary market develops, an electronic trading system together with uh, the securities settlement system uh, will also become necessary. So it will be important for the debt management system to talk to these other systems. Please note that these other systems may not be operated. In fact, in a lot of cases, in most cases, they won't be operated by the debt office. They may be operated by the central bank some, or some other organizations. So this then creates the challenge of data exchange and of institutional coordination uh, between uh, the various organizations. And the other big uh, subsystem which uh, countries will, will, will face is IFMIS. I won't go into this, but uh, the diagram uh, here gives you an idea of where the DIMIS is located within the family of, uh, of the systems. What are the other attributes then, or the attributes of an efficient or successful DIMIS? Well, let me say in the first instance that the successful implementation of a debt management information system is really a shared responsibility uh, between uh, the provider of a DIMIS, but also the user country. So from a system's point of view, I've listed a few, uh, a few attributes here. I will just focus on one or two at random. Uh, the quality of technical and user documentation, I think, is key. If I was assessing a DIMIS, I would give a, a, a big score to uh, a technical and user documentation. A, a, a DIMIS which is not well documented is almost impossible to use. And also, to be able to transfer data in and out of the system, you need to know the structure of a database and so forth, and the technical uh, documentation, which is different from the user documentation, becomes very important. The system's performance also is very important, and there are about three dimensions of performance. There's performance in terms against the hardware. What kind of hardware do you need to be able to run the DIMIS? There's performance in terms of the database. Faced with a big, large database, uh, how will the system perform? And also uh, in terms of users. Uh, half a hundred users uh, accessing the system or 50 users accessing the system at the same time will the DIMIS perform. And the only way you can do this is to benchmark and test the system. However, there are two issues which I want to mention which are equally important. And they go beyond the debt management information system. One is, information, is data. Uh, the information flow has to be optimal, data has to flow through to the DIMIS. The debt management office has to validate the database regularly, and data validation is really both a continuous process and a periodic process. And the periodic process would be maybe a debt data audit. And there are frameworks which you can use. The one which I use usually is the IMF 
the CAF framework, Data Quality Assessment Framework, which looks at the database in terms of four dimensions, coverage, quality, methodology, and timeliness. And these dimensions are mutually exclusive, which means you could have 100% coverage, high quality, 100% methodological soundness, but not timely. And there are various permutations of this. And finally, I think, Data dissemination is very important. It's only when you start using the dead database that uh, you put it to the test and there should be a feedback loop between the arrow on the right hand side to the arrow on the left hand side in the diagram which I showed earlier on. In other words, there should be a feedback loop between output and input. And then finally, people. Let's not forget that a common reason why management information systems fail in general is the lack of ownership. So users must be involved in the selection or the review of a DMIS, and users must be adequately, adequately trained. Now this is my last slide, and this graph is actually uh, compiled from data which comes from the PFM systems and e-services global data set, which is maintained by the World Bank, and uh, may I take this opportunity to thank Sam Dana for providing me access uh, and providing me with a copy of the database. I won't comment on the itself explanatory, but let me touch on a few questions, frequently asked questions, and I will refer to the, uh, to the chart as we go along. So the first question which I'm usually asked is, do all countries need a DMIS? And in my view, the answer is a big yes. I think even countries that have small debt databases, uh, it would make sense to use the debt management information system because it's really practically impossible to do the kind of cost risk analysis you want to do to maintain, uh, okay. you know, the uh, to to do the kind of analysis that you want to fulfill the the functions of a debt office. Um, the second question is in-house versus off the shelf. Now, if you look at the chart, you will see that only 14% of the 198 countries uh, polled by the bank, uh, only 14% uh, chose in-house uh, in -house to develop a system in-house. Of course, an in-house system, if properly designed and implemented, is likely to model the country's workflow more closely. However, the problem is really in the risk uh, of, de of developing such a system, there is, there's a project management risk, and there's also a software development risk and complexity, which the country should be careful about. Also, the cost of in-house system um, usually would be higher than uh, an off-the-shelf. At the last World Bank uh, Sovereign Debt Management Forum in last October, uh, the representative from South Africa gave some figures which illustrates this fact. And I hope I got them right. Uh, she said that uh, South Africa had decided to implement its own DMIS, and that the, the, the figure quoted for the development was 2.2 million US dollars. That was an initial investment of 0.5 million, followed by further expenditure of 1.7 million. And that the recurrent cost was about 200,000 US dollars Per annum. So that gives you uh, an idea of uh, the cost involved. The web. Third question is about CSDMS and DIMFAS versus commercial products. Uh, if you look at the statistics, you will find that uh, CSDMS and DIMFAS uh, account uh, for over 100 countries, in fact, 109 countries. Uh, so they are the two together, the two software together really dominate uh, the market while commercial products uh, account for about 25. In fact, in the version that was circulated of a presentation, uh, it's written 27, uh, there's a typo where it should be 25%. Now, in my view, most developing and a large number of emerging countries, which predominantly have multilateral, bilateral, standard commercial loans, would probably be better off using CSDMS or DIMPAS. These systems will also handle common domestic debt instruments, 
such as treasury bills and bonds. Some emerging countries and more developed countries, which use more complex instruments with embedded risk management features, which use Web derivatives, Visit our website. we probably Web want to consider commercial Web. products as these are more geared to the banking and corporate sector, uh, which tend to use these products. But at the end of the day, countries need to, be, to undertake a needs assessment of their needs. I would also want to mention, uh, to issue a word of warning here, because when choosing a commercial product, there are lots of commercial products in the market which claim to be able to manage debt. Uh, we have treasury management systems, cash flow systems, front and middle office systems, and not all of them are probably geared to the use to the needs of a debt management office. So you might want to think carefully and assess them here. Fourth question, are current DMIS meeting the needs of countries? Well, that's a good question. I think in my view, mostly, uh, the, uh, the current DMIS are mostly meeting uh, the needs of countries, but not completely. And I'll give you two examples. Uh, in my work, in many countries, I find that there are still gaps in the databases. Uh, some categories of loans uh, cannot be readily captured by the DMIS. And one example, for example, uh, for example is Islamic uh, loans or Islamic products, financial products. So these tend to be kept in spreadsheets and then added manually. And this can be a source of concern, as I explained before. Also, another important issue is on the reporting side. Um, where uh, countries have difficulties uh, extracting data uh, for, uh, you know, in, from the system. Uh, and this is something which needs to be addressed. I think the answers to the, or the, the solutions to these two problems is that number one, providers should focus on core functionality and not be tempted to expand demises, but to concentrate on the core functionality which has which I mentioned before. So I'm not really sure whether a DMIS should really be concerned about PPPs and contingent liabilities and cash management. These, these areas are probably uh, need specialized modules of software separately. And finally, can a country outgrow its current DMIS? Well, I think yes. Uh, if a country adopted a DMIS 10, 15, or 20 years ago, Obviously, the needs of this con uh, these countries would have changed, in spite of the efforts of providers to keep their software current. So, in my view, it is important for countries to review their DMIS, uh, how the DMIS is performing from time to time, say every five years, and if there are issues, find ways to address them. This doesn't mean that you need to change your DMIS. Maybe the issue is related to a data flow problem, or you need to be to have some customized reports written or some modules built around the DMIS. But definitely, I would recommend a regular review of your DMIS. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to expand on some of these questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jose. This is excellent. And uh, in the Q&A session at the end, I'm sure we will have some questions for you. Uh, so now I would like to introduce Andre Proite, who is currently the head of the public debt back office in Brazil, in charge of uh, debt payments, control, and executing federal guarantees. Uh, this is the position that Andre has been holding since uh, last October. Uh, Andre joined the Brazilian National Treasury in 2004, and he headed the Investor Relations Unit from 2006 to 16. Uh, where he was responsible for engaging the external and domestic investor base as a focal point regarding debt management strategy and related topics. Uh, Andre was also responsible for developing the local market retail sales program for the Treasury. His work with the IMF, World Bank, and AFTAC, delivering consultancies on various aspects of debt and risk management. Over to you, Andre. Thanks, everyone, for, for the invitation. Uh, thank, I'd like to thank the World Bank for. Uh, for the invitation to share uh, about the opportunity to share our, our experience. I'd like to start saying that Brazil doesn't really have an off-the-shelf system. We are part of that 14% uh, that was just presented uh, by uh, Jose. 
Okay, so we have our own dead system. Uh, and the reason behind it is that back in 2000, uh, in the wake of the reshuffle of our GMO and tree standard offices, uh, chances were that key information related to that, let's say maturity profile, uh, uh, were imprecise, as there were some cases where either the back office or even the, the front office, they had, uh, they had uh, 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 discrepancy, and we have a very hard time finding that, finding the reason behind that. And whenever that occurred, we spent hours and hours uh, dealing with uh, four systems, with five access, at least five uh, databases, and dozens of spreadsheets. Uh, we had a very hard time in, into dealing with four systems and dozens of spreadsheets. And uh, so we did have a very hard time to, to find the kind of IT service that we needed to integrate all of these obsolete uh, systems that were ongoing. So uh, this was quite challenging. Everything has always been a big debt, many instruments. So it, it didn't take us long to understand that uh, uh, we had to build our own system uh, to fulfill our needs. We would have to deal with the external debt, the domestic debt, uh, contractual debt, uh, budgetary issues, uh, financial programming, uh, the, the link, and all the linkages with the federal financial transactions, payment systems, and clearing houses. Okay? So we decided to build the SID, which is an acronym which stands for Integrated Debt System. Everyone if you please could, could return to, to slide five, please. Okay, thank you. So uh, from from one to, to eight in this slide, you're going to see uh, the key functionalities associated with the current outstanding debt. So it does record all transactions, the issuances, the, the exchanges, the buybacks, switches, so on and so forth, uh, yielding an outstanding uh, debt. And also, uh, from there, we're going to derive many, many uh, risk indicators. Uh, it generates the payment flows, and specifically uh, has a, an important uh, application or functionality on, uh, that deals with, with, uh, with, uh, with not only uh, the buyback, but also with liability management uh, operations, which were started to pick up by, by then. And then, uh, and then, uh, this was important. Whenever the so in this functionality enabled the back office to input uh, the incoming prices that were coming from the, the trading desk area uh, to uh, generate new uh, new flows and also uh, to affect all the statistics and the then business model. So. Uh, it also calculates some key risk indicators, the average maturity, the average life, which is the standard ATM, average cost, uh, the, the short-term debt, the debt maturing in 12 months, and any other frame, uh, any time frame that you would like. It also, uh, it also uh, allows us to break down the debt, uh, to break the debt with the profile, which, uh, which states the share of fixed rate debt, Floating rate tab, for exchange rate tab, uh, and here is an important uh, application. You can easily combine all of the above indicators, breaking down in many others in order to have uh, a clear view of your debt profile and structure. So now, switching to the perspective mode, you can upload different scenarios and debt strategies to yield a great deal of, of new estimates for the public debt. Uh, including uh, uh, debt and maturity, and also the stock. Um, so uh, this generate is important because uh, it's materialized in the budget and the, our budget and our main publications, uh, which are which we will describe not only the estimates uh, embedded in our financing plan, but also the checkpoints down the road. Uh, it also has. Uh, number 13 and 14, two, sub, two modules related to the front office. Uh, with the first one allows uh, people to, to price bonds. And then the auctions, uh, whenever the auction occurs, they are inputted in 
in this in the own system, and then it affects the the routines, the accountability, the books, uh, the financial system, which is going to be important. Okay. So after that, uh, it, it, it relates into the back office. So if you could please do the next slide. Thank you. Um, so, a quick word on the system. Uh, it, it, it does uh, carry, it does uh, use free software. So why is that an advantage? So we're not subjected to the supplier. So, uh, supplier update. So the version I use is the version I need. Uh, sometimes the updates that are provided are not so significant. And, uh, we have independence from the supplier. It's important to insulate us from contractual risk. Yes, uh, since, we, since we were building our own system, uh, we had uh, problems with that in the beginning of the project. Some of them have gone under, and we have, eventually we will have to change. If we were stuck with one of them, uh, we would have a uh, huge problem to, to carry on with the development of the project. So we also have independence from the operational system, either Linux or Windows. And last is web-based, uh, which is in line with the current uh, technology, uh, the desktop technology available uh, back out there. Of course, if you want more details, we can chat in a later session. So moving on, please. Um, you, so let's, let's have a look on how the, the system spends all of our debt. So basically, uh, we, like I said earlier, the Brazilian debt is not only big, but it's also complicated. We run, on a weekly basis, we run uh, multiple operations to finance the debt and currently the budgetary debt as well. So we roughly need deal with 3,700 instruments, but let's, let's take a look into that. When it comes to the external debt, uh, it's plain vanilla. Uh, it's important to note here, interesting as well, that the contractual debt has, uh, is all encompassing. It has all types of contracts, all shapes of debt, with different, uh, either bullet, price, FAC, uh, different interest rates, a bundle of currencies, uh, whatever you, you, you're going to design in the contract. Uh, this is very important for a number of companies that are reliant on these instruments to fund their activities, or even donations that can also be uh, mildly uh, uh, adapted from there. Um, so regarding the domestic debt, you wonder why we have such a staggering number. So be careful, because only 2% of these uh, instruments are actually issued through uh, traditional auctions, uh, contrasting with the remaining instruments that are launched through direct instances associated with special programs uh, uh, for specific raising funds for a specific uh, purpose. It's important to see that 97% of our cash that is raised with these uh, are only reliant on 51, no, no more than 51 uh, instruments that are actually tradable. So, uh, so we, our financing plan and our financing activities are reliant on a, a, a limited number of, of, of bonds. Uh, but because we have such a complicated debt, you know, dragging things from the past, and a lot of securitization, we have a, this very big number of investments that the system, in turn, would have to be prepared to deal with. Uh, for the contractual debt, it's uh, more related to the guarantee systems that we are that we are uh, devoting ourselves to build. We're also going to see some more in a minute. So we, what is the capillarity and who would use our system? So please move to the next slide. Uh, the bulk of the people uh, dealing with the system work in the back office, so it's really IT intensive. Uh, but also about four people in the front office and about four people also in the middle office uh, doing uh, this kind of activities that I show you. We also have currently uh, 12 people uh, 
working as developers in the IT uh, the unit and, and the company that is attached to it. So currently we're also doing some internal training and we, we plan to fulfill that specifically this year. So if you move on, uh, you're going to see the integration with the other systems. Uh, and it is it was, was very it is very challenging aspect to deal with because the connection uh, 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 is needed with at least five systems. So if you if you go to system uh, to to platform A, it relates to the stock exchange. Uh, it's a private privately owned company, and there are the partners uh, from the treasury to run the retail sales program uh, that we have here. Uh, as for B, we also it's also a uh, privately owned uh, clearinghouse where they uh, hold and, and register most of the non-tradable or you know, direct issuances instruments uh, that I mentioned earlier. So most of the action uh, happens on C, which is the special system of settlement and custody. When we you know uh, most of our bonds are. Uh, the most important and the, the action and the transactions happen over there. So as for A, B, and C, uh, there is little, little human interference in the process. So the analysts here, they have to uh, chunk in their websites and their systems and drag all the data that is coming from there and plug it into our own system and then does the, the cross-checking and the double, the double check uh, to see if there is uh, these matches or so. Uh, okay, so about user friendliness, uh, reporting tools, we do have uh, predefined reports, um, but it also allows us to uh, filter and, and also customize the outputs that we're going to uh, modify for, for each purposes. Uh, it also allows us to export those things to you know, common uh, Microsoft uh, Excel spreadsheets and so on. When it turns to uh, the operational tools, the web access uh, is, is web-based, so we use internet browsers. We do have uh, digital certificates and user logins to uh, have different access levels. We also have uh, an interesting tool here which allows the system, whenever it finds some, some discrepancy, it fires an email to specific people to see what's going on. So if you move to slide 11, you know, uh, where, what is the current stage and what, stages and what are the next steps? So like I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we are building a guarantees project, uh, as a module that will lead us to have a better a, a, a better understanding of the managing and managing of the contingent liabilities that these guarantees represent. Um, we're going to be able to work and to better uh, forecast the flows of the portfolios of guarantees, derive important risk indicators of all of that, which is quite a hot topic in Brazil right now. In parallel, we are uh, completing the integration with the uh, financial uh, system uh, for the federal debt, for the federal government, with our own debt system, which is uh, we're going to automate, uh, create more automatic automatic processes uh, underlying into that. So it's quite challenging to, to do that as well. Uh, also in parallel, uh, we're working on uh, allowing remote access for users using the internet. So what are the next steps? We are currently, uh, uh, we're also going to have to uh, perfect the strategic planning of federal public debt, and also prepare the system to also uh, harbor the internet, the subnational debt that we will also control by them. So we also want to impose and to allow uh, the users to derive the analytical tools and usual risk measures uh, associated with that. So moving next, uh, finally, so what are the results, the costs, and the lessons? So uh, looking at the system right now, we 
uh, think that we accomplished our main goal, which, uh, which was to consolidate a database, removing all of the redundancy and occasional inconsistency. We gained uh, quality in the statistical analysis. We have, uh, uh, we have disabled the older system and also the, those spreadsheets that were uh, back, used back then. Uh, we also improved the quality of the budgetary process. And then we, we did a full integration with the, we are going to complete the full integration with the government uh, accounting system that I mentioned earlier. Uh, what are the costs? Uh, first, let me uh, say that the costs were high, are high, but they're not pretty much comparable with the other alternatives that you uh, you're gonna uh, find when you're gonna shop or you're gonna uh, gonna search for off-the-shelf products that are, are are out there. And the reason behind it is that the developer in Brazil is an state-owned company, IT company, with different types of relationships with the treasury. And it's not really treated at arm's length uh, as any other company. So, uh, so basically, we're we're looking at uh, four million dollars since 2005 uh, up to 2018, and we also bear a cost of about 1.4 million per year for for hosting. What are the main lessons? Uh, first, uh, work hard. The term of if you're gonna work on the uh, build your own system, you would have to work hard on the term of reference. So you would have to work hard on the term of reference, which you're gonna, if you're gonna to build on your own. So the project manager is key. We need clear definition of roles. Uh, we need full-time dedication of project owners, which is, uh, is where the project, whenever we did that, the project really took off. So uh, that, that was uh, what I was going to say. Uh, I'm sorry about these problems with the connections with the, with the, in, and also with the noise. Uh, I would like to thank the hard working people here in our back office for the assistance and for the support in putting together this presentation. But also would like to thank our IT unit here uh, represented by Mr. Lincoln Moray. Thank you very much, Andre, for, next, for another excellent presentation. Uh, so, uh, and, and in the meantime, uh, you can send your questions through chat window. We will collect them and uh, address them during the Q&A session. Uh, so, last but not least, I would like to present to you Renata Davidkova Pancheva. Uh, she is the head of the back office in the Department for International Financial Relations and Public Debt Management within the Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Macedonia. Uh, Renata was appointed for that position in 2005 when the Public Debt Management Department was established. Throughout her career as the Ministry, Renata worked in major Ministry of Finance projects such as the establishment of the Treasury Department and the establishment of the Public Debt Management Department. Renata was involved in the implementation of the Public Debt Management Information System project from 2008 until its completion in 2012 and since then, she's been actively working on further on improving it. Uh, so over to you, Renata. You can share your screen. And I think the static disappeared now. So um, apologies again for all those um, technical problems today. Over to you, Renata. Hello. Thank you very much, Gida. Uh, hello to all participants of the webinar. I'm Renata and I'm speaking from the Ministry of Finance of Macedonia and thank, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the World Bank for giving me an uh, opportunity to share with you a Macedonian experience of the development of the Macedonian debt management information system and to present uh, its main characteristic and functionality. Uh, is, is everything fine with the... Okay. Yes, sounds very good. Thank you. Uh, the implementation of information system for public debt management was necessary for the Macedonian Ministry of Finance to deal with the debt management activities in order to standardize the business processes related to debt management 
to improve it and its efficiency and to increase control over the financial and operational risk that are accompanying debt management activities. The debt management system is a web-based application that is created on an independent database platform. Its main purpose is to... Uh, uh, sorry, I missed that. In this regard, in 2008, we have started the project for implementation of an integrated system for public debt management that will support government measures and activities for providing financing of government needs at the lowest possible cost on a medium and long run, at, an, at a sustainable risk level, as well as development and maintenance of efficient uh, financial domestic markets. In 2008, we had a public procurement procedure where the domestic IT company, ASECO, was selected to design and implement the debt management system and where the team of eight IT system developers were engaged in the development of our IT debt management system. Total costs for the Ministry of Finance for developing such system were approximately 0.2 million euros and uh, the project has been finalized fully in 2012 when the system was uh, fully operational and put in the process uh, in the debt management activities. Currently, the system is under maintenance contract and the costs for the maintenance are in range of 10 to 20% of the contract value of the value of the software depends of our needs, whether we need some uh, only maintenance of the system or some additional extensions are necessary in the meantime. Uh, currently, uh, all 10 people in the Ministry of Finance, employees in the Ministry of Finance who are in charge of the debt management activities are active users of the debt management uh, system, which is a uh, web-based application model created on an independent database platform. The main purpose of the debt management system is to support debt management activities on one side, and in this regard, to, uh, it creates, it provides an integrated overview of the debt management portfolio. Also, it provides an overview of the all debt transactions as well as uh, a good reporting system. The basic principle concerning transaction processing by the debt management system is the straight through transaction processing, beginning from front office deal capture and ending with back office settlement. Uh, debt management system has interfaces with two crucial uh, information systems. One is internal within the Ministry of Finance, that is Treasury in Treasury Information System, and the uh, interface is used for monitoring the debt transactions. And the second uh, interface is with the National Bank platform. It is a so-called e-bank platform on which National Bank is putting some files that should be imported in the debt management system. Before I move to present debt management system in more, more, more details, I would like to share a little, um, a little details about the debt management activity in the Macedonian Ministry of Finance. Namely, uh, debt management operations in the Macedonian Ministry of Finance are performed by three units that are part of the International Financial Relations and Public Debt Management Department. And those units are front office, uh, responsible for borrowing and investment, middle office in charge of debt management policy and risk carrying out risk analysis, and finally back office responsible for recording, monitoring, and servicing of public debt liabilities. Those three units are involved in dealing with core debt management activities such as financing budget needs, designing debt management strategy, 
debt recording and time servicing of debt liabilities. But despite these activities, these units also carry out activities related to on lending credits, assessment of borrowing requests submitted by public debt issuers, preparing reports in line with the international standards and other similar uh, activities. Macedonian, uh, Macedonian uh, debt portfolio is consists of a variety of debt instruments, but mm, uh, such as loans that are possessed by the central government, local, go local government, or state-owned enterprises loans. Then also euro bonds are used by the debt management uh, units in the ministry, uh, T-bills and T-bonds for domestic markets, as well as structural bonds. A uh, major part, approximately 90% uh, of all entries in uh, debt management system belongs to those debt instruments, mainly to T-bills and T-bonds. And uh, the remain of 9% uh, belongs to the on-lending loans that are loans taken by the government from the foreign creditors and then repassed to the other public debt issuers municipalities or state-owned enterprises in form of uh, sub-loans. Uh, please note here that the guarantees are part of the state-owned enterprises loans and uh, the system also captured the guaranteed debt and it's a good tool for managing the contingent liabilities. Uh, as I previously mentioned, one of the main purposes of the debt management system is to support debt management activities. In this regard, the system is based on three main modules supporting operation of uh, front office that are related to issuance of government securities, issuance of structural bonds, and assessment of borrowing requests. As for the middle office activities, the system provides projections on stock of debt, projection on debt transactions like disbursement, repayment, interest payments, and uh, all these data uh, can be presented on different levels of debt coverage. Also, the system offers an opportunity for middle office to calculate the risk indicators such as average time to maturity and average time to refixing, and uh, overview of the currency and interest rate structure of the debt portfolio in order to measure its sensitivity uh, to the market movements of the interest rate and exchange rates. Uh, but at the end, the debt management system in Macedonian Ministry of Finance is mainly back office, is supporting mainly back office activities. And, uh, provide, and it com provides a complete automation of the whole workflow beginning from the recording of debt instruments, registration and realization of the debt transaction, and its settlement. As I already mentioned and I previously explained, the system has two interfaces. One is with uh, internal with uh, the treasury information system and another one is the external with the central bank platform, so-called eBank. Uh, with treasury system, we are sharing the data uh, about the debt transaction, while with the national bank platform, we are sharing data about the balances of the ethics accounts, statements of the ethics accounts, auction results, ownership books of the general government uh, holders, and uh, similar data. As for the main functionality, the, even here our aggregate in four, the system is dispersed, uh, dispersed in more functionalities, but we have, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, we have uh, con concretized in four main functionalities. The first one is the loan administration that tracks the flow of the loan agreement starting from the request for borrowing, then signing of the loan agreement, recording loan transactions, and settlement of those transactions. Next, the module for government securities 
mainly used by for, uh, front office, provides a comprehensive overview of the government securities portfolio. Uh, so far, Ministry of Finance is using national bank platform to carry out auctions of T-bills and T-bonds on the domestic financial market. But the results from the auctions are recording in the debt management system through interface with uh, national bank platform eBank. On lending mod module, just as a loan administration, is very useful tool for back office activities, providing the overview of the government's loans passed to the other public debt issuers, municipalities and state-owned enterprises, and this tool keeps track and keep records on each on lending agreement, its transaction, and automatically generates payment notification that back office is further sending to the final beneficiary. And last but not least, module and the functionality of reports provides a set of predefined standard reports such as stock of government securities, stock of total debt, stock of debt transactions, um, debt structure, etc., and also provides an opportunity uh, for the users of the system to create their own system, their own reports, depend on what their needs. Additionally, the system also uh, uh, provides analytical tools for the middle office to assess the debt portfolio to interest and exchange rates movement and to calculate risk measures such as average time to maturity and average uh, time to refixing. The processes supported by the debt management system relates mainly to back office activities such as generation of amortization plans for all debt instruments in accordance with the data entered in the loan register and government securities register, then generation of payment calendars, which facilitates, facilitates the monitoring of due dates of debt liabilities, creation of invoices and payment orders, thus reducing the possibility of error and omissions in the repayment process, and settlement of debt transaction. This is a print screenshot of the debt, public debt management system in the Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Macedonia, just to have a clue how it is look like. As I previously said, it is a web-based platform and it, it is a very friendly user and easy to use uh, to go through it. Uh, before I... Uh, that the benefits, benefits that we get from the system, I must mention that in 2005, when the debt management department was established, the data, uh, debt data in Macedonian Ministry of Finance were diverse in different departments. Debt data were dispersed across various departments in the National Bank of Macedonia and in uh, a lot of spreadsheets in the debt management departments. Uh, the implementation of debt management system firstly provides us to have an integral and integrated overview of the total public debt portfolio, Macedonian public debt portfolio, and allow us to centralize debt data on one place. Also, a lot of processes, especially in uh, back office, that were accompanied with uh, huge operational risk were automized. Also, the principle of uh, four eyes principle were introduced in all three units, in all, all, all three units involved in the debt management activities, and it uh, contributed a, lo a lot in reducing the operational risk in, execu in executing debt management activities. Uh, also, the system contributed in the improvement of the skills of employees in charge of debt related operations and at the same time improves the quality of, of work and the flow of work, work related to the debt management. The transparency of the debt management was also improved since a lot of reports can be done for a short period of time 
and also a decision making in the field of debt, uh, debt management was uh, facilitated since more accurate and more aggregate data were uh, available for, for those units. Developing system is not an, a one-time process. It is an ongoing process that, uh, from my perspective, never ends. Uh, whenever I'm working with the system, I'm always inspired uh, to improve some existing functionality or to create a new one. Uh, of course, uh, of course, the business business processes are evolving. Uh, and appropriate adjustments in the system also should be done just to accommodate to the new occurred uh, situation. Uh, in this regard, uh, all three units in, involved in the debt management activities are looking for the development of the new functionalities in the debt management system and also to adjust and improve the existing functionalities. As for the existing functionality in terms of front office, uh, we will look uh, to develop uh, a more accurate projections of government securities net issuance and repayments. As for the middle office, uh, we will try to develop a new analytical tools that will support the decision making and the process of creation of debt management strategy as well as the, uh, we will accommodate the system to provide the quality data source that will be used as an input of the uh, World Bank analytical tool medium term debt strategy that uh, was recently introduced in the ministry, Macedonian Ministry of Finance. As for the back office, we are going to uh, further automate the payment and settlement processes just to further reduce some additional operational risks that has occurred in the meantime. Also, a uh, huge challenge, challenge for us is to develop uh, a functionality to make the system functional to, pre to generate the reports according to international standard methodologies, which is a project that is uh, currently uh, carrying, out in the, uh, carrying on in the Ministry of uh, Finance. Uh, currently, Macedonian debt portfolio is uh, not uh, consist any financial derivative, but we consider it is, as a useful tool for debt management. So we are looking uh, for part to develop a new model in the system related to uh, financial derivatives. Uh, also, we will try to improve the existing interfaces uh, in terms of uh, more automized uh, data sharing with the current uh, system that we have interfaces. And we're also looking forward to introduce a new interfaces, for example, with a central security depository, which is owing the ownership book for uh, government securities. Also, since Ministry of Finance is collecting uh, several reports from the public that issues, concretely, municipalities and state owned enterprises, and those reports are submitting on paper. We will do our, we, are try, we will try to do uh, uh, in our system to give the internet to those public debt issuers so they can be, uh, they can submit their reports through direct access to the debt management uh, system. Thank you very much, Renata, uh, for another uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, so now, uh, I mean, what's interesting here, we had a very good overview from Jose, and we heard from two country cases with well-developed information systems, which cover uh, all the core functions of debt management. So while we are connecting the questions, we would like to uh, conduct a quick poll. Uh, so we will, uh, I will read the question now, and Amira will send the question to your screen. So you should pick, so the question is, what are the top three 
uh, features you expect from your debt management information system. Uh, Amira is sharing it. Okay, give me one second. Okay. So if you can just click, uh, the question is what are the top three features you expect from your debt management information system? And the choices are there, access to historic information, connection with other platforms such as financial management information system, treasury systems, Excel, Bloomberg, customization, which is the ability to create new instruments, integration among modules between front, middle, back office, low maintenance or an upgrade cost, reporting features, security of data, speed, user friendliness. So please pick and we will show you the pick the top three which are important to you and we will show the results. Actually we are seeing the results uh, and it's getting there. Do you want to give it one minute? Maybe one minute for everybody to finish uh, voting. Sorry, uh, it was on mute so I'm trying again. Mm -hmm. So this question is for uh, Andre and Renata. Uh, the question is, uh, you know, it, I mean, and you, uh, you said that you, you develop your systems in-house. Uh, so how were you able to do that? Uh, from your, it, drawing from your experience, which do you think is more cost-effective and cost-efficient? Developing in-house or obtaining systems like DAMFA, CFDRMS, or other commercial products? And the speakers already uh, elaborated a bit on that, but we would like to hear from them. Uh, so maybe we can start with Renata and continue with Andre. Question is, can you hear me well? Yes, I'm the hearing well. Okay, the question is, how were you able to develop your own system? Uh, and which one do you think is more cost effective and cost efficient? Developing in-house, because it took you four years, right? Uh, and uh, it, an off-the-shelf system uh, you, it can be acquired in one year. So the question is, how, uh, which one is more cost-effective and cost-efficient? Using one of the ready-made systems which are available like DAMFAS and CSDRMS or other uh, commercial products versus developing in-house. You did mention a bit, but if you were to do it again, uh, and if there was a system which um, responds to your needs, would you again develop in-house or buy it from the market? Let me start uh, with the fact that I have uh, I ha had no experience with the other system like DMFS or CDRM is, and uh, I can just assume how the cost effective they are. Uh, personally, I think that uh, in both cases there is pros and cons, uh, since if you are uh, developing your own system, you are uh, developing on your terms of references, on the techni technical specification uh, created uh, by you, and you are adopting to your needs at the moment you are creating the system. Uh, I have no experience with the off-the-shelf system, but uh, when we uh, deliberate uh, and look at the different variation, whether to supply in-house or off-the-shelf, uh, our main criteria on the public procurement process was the uh, cost, the price of the software. I mentioned that the price of our software at that time, 2008, was uh, 0 0.2 million euros, uh, euros, which I can share with you that it was a really, really uh, low price compared to the, to the other bids uh, offered on that public procurement. Uh, personally, if I uh, once again need to choose whether to build in-house system or to use off-the-shelf, I will also again once again keep the in-house system since uh, it is built and adopt to our current situation, our current portfolio, and our needs. Uh, once again, I can say that I don't have any experience with off-the-shelf, but my experience with building in-house systems is very nice, and I will 
recommended warmly. Thank you very much, Renata. Um, over to you, Andre. By the way, uh, actually we finished the time, uh, we were supposed to finish at 10.30, but given the technical problems, we will extend by another 10, 10, 15 minutes. Hopefully you will stay with us. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Andre. Thanks, Jidan uh, and Emira. Uh, well, we, we think it's a really, it's a really a case by case decision. I'll say uh, when we took that decision many years ago, uh, like I was explaining, it was a very complicated uh, alternative not to do that. In other words, if you were to either update the existing systems or either adapt the uh, off-the-shelf instruments that were available at that time, it would be it would be very costly. It would be very inefficient because the adaptation which wouldn't be uh, smooth uh, and it would be very difficult to achieve the results that we currently uh, observe. So, uh, in, in the other hand, it was costly, uh, but I think what, what is the, the, the highest cost that one could bear is spending tons of money and not, and not having a satisfying a satisfying product output in the end. So, um, and how were we able to do that? We did uh, set aside some uh, significant amount of money, uh, and but you know the debt is complicated. Brazilian debt is complicated. Um, it's uh, it involves numerous instruments uh, and, and so on. So we have a, a nice experience in, in doing it in the house. Uh, there were some bumps along the way. Uh, what I could say is that in the beginning of the process, uh, people were really actually reluctant or even either refraining to participate into the project. But what we see now as, uh, is that people are eager to see what's coming next uh, as we had uh, very uh, important POs participating in, uh, in the project in the many phases that we unfolded. Thank you very much, Andre. And um, I, I kind of agree with both comments. Uh, it is really nice to have to be able to tailor your information system uh, based on, on your needs. At the same time, uh, as uh, all the speakers mentioned, this is really an issue of resources, buy-in from the users. It, I think this is one of the most difficult ones, you know, to manage the user expectations. Uh, so we will, you know, continue to discuss these issues. Uh, but now my next question is for Jose, uh, and the question is: What steps can be taken to ensure that users can properly capture new financial products in their debt management system, especially if these instruments are complex to capture? Should the CSDRMS and fast providers play a role? Before continuing, as Jose was showing in his um, in his table. Uh, only 14% of the uh, countries develop their own system, so most of them actually use the existing uh, solutions, uh, the CSDRMS and AMFAS. Yes, now uh, over to you, Jose. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chidam. I think this is an excellent question. Uh, let me stress that uh, if we take CSDRMS and AMFAS as an example, I think these current uh, debt management information systems uh, do capture a large percentage of debt instruments already, so uh, external and domestic. So there's no specific reason uh, why they should not be able to capture uh, those instruments which are more difficult and which um, sometimes have to be maintained in spreadsheets. Um, I think the problem is that, first of all, users also have a responsibility to provide feedback to the providers so that when they encounter a, a, a group of loans or maybe uh, certain products which is, is not really fitting if you are into the, into the DIMIS, uh, they should inform the provider and study and see what solutions uh, can be adopted. Um, it can be a case sometimes where a country may have just two or three instruments uh, that do not fit into, into the uh, you know, existing system. 
uh, in this case, I think a customized solution might be the answer rather than uh, the provider, uh, you know, spending resources to address the needs of just one country because obviously resources are scarce. Um, also, I think uh, from the provider's point of view, uh, better communication with uh, uh, the issuers uh, and commercial issuers, especially or, or multilateral, bilateral issuers, uh, would help in, in so far as they would know what are the products that are coming up and what are the features, and these features are then uh, you know catered for in subsequent version. And finally, I think there's a case could be made for collaboration uh, between providers because at the end of the day, all the providers are trying to tackle uh, the same the same beasts, uh, the same instruments. So uh, maybe a, a division of labor and sharing experiences and saying, okay, how do you handle this and so forth, uh, could actually reduce uh, the cost of development and research to cater for, for really at the periphery, we're talking here about the, you know, the, at the periphery of the debt uh, portfolio rather than the core instruments, which I think are, are pretty well captured. Thank you very much, Jose. So the next question is again for Renata and Andre. Um, so the question is, both Brazil and Macedonia are operating web-based systems. Does this pose any significant challenge, for instance, in terms of accessibility, real-time data update, etc.? cetera? Uh, maybe we can start with Renata. Uh, thank you, Jidan. Yes, uh, our system is web-based, and uh, we had a good, a very good access, real-time uh, presentation of the data, and uh, so far, we haven't seen any problems uh, with using such platform. It is, uh, as for the security side, there is a specific uh, security measures that IT de department is providing regarding this system. Uh, and the main feature of this, uh, main advantages of this uh, web-based platform is if the security allows, you can have the access to the database wherever you are. But under the uh, strict security uh, regulation. Thank you. Uh, Andre? Sorry, are you finished, Renata? Sorry. Yes, I'm finished. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, Andre, please. Okay, um, I would definitely agree with Renata. Um, I think uh, the fact that our system is also web-based, uh, it allows us to uh, have a very good performance in uh, coming out with the outputs uh, almost in real time uh, in a very secure way. So the usability of the of it's it's very important for for people to get acquainted with uh, with the tools and the functionalities. The fact that we can uh, use uh, specific filters to generate either analytical or consolidated reports uh, is very handy. Um, so this is, this, I think these are the most important uh, aspects uh, of the system, of course. Uh, also, uh, uh, being able to manage with a very big, uh, uh, a very, a very complete and expensive uh, databases uh, beneath it. Thank you. Uh, so now I will talk about the next question. I mean, there was one comment. Uh, we will we will share some, uh, all the questions and the comments. But there was just one comment, and I'll say one part of it. So the comment was that given the cost of developing uh, those in-house systems, it is clear that the current existing commercial solutions. Uh, namely that the Danfoss and the CSGMS are still very competitive. So that was one comment from one of the participants. Um, but moving on, uh, one question, two, two uh, participants have similar questions. So this is a question for all the speakers. Um, parallel running systems, the existing and the new system, uh, the fact that uh, which are being implemented uh, at the same time, right, before the new system to go on, on live. Uh, it is uh, key to have a successful implementation, obviously, during this transition period. 
Uh, so the question is, if a country decides to stop using the existing system and plans to use another debt recording system, what are the key considerations that need to be taken into account during the transition period? And the second, uh, and I will complement this with the second question. For example, this may include ensuring the new system uh, that uh, ensuring that the new system can generate the operational and an analytical reports of the existing system through report customization, for example. So, what are the considerations during this transition? Uh, maybe we can start with Jose. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chidam. Again, a very uh, important and um, interesting question. Uh, I will answer. I will give a generic answer. I mean. There are techniques uh, that are used uh, every day uh, to migrate data from one system to another. Uh, and these are, we usually refer to them as data migration techniques. Um, and sometimes even using one system and you're in installing a new version, uh, you would be engaged into converting the database or migrating the database from one version to another. So data migration is quite common in IT. Um, this data migration usually is performed uh, with a combination of electronic data migration, uh, which is convenient, so you transfer the data electronically from one system to the, to the other. But uh, in many cases, if you're actually changing systems, uh, you might need a manual intervention and manual input of some data. Um, this um, electronic data migration can be performed either using commercial software, which is uh, designed to manage this, or using um, custom written uh, routines, uh, which, which you can use. But I think the most important point is that uh, if any migration has to be carefully planned and carefully managed, there has to be a lot of testing. And once you migrated the data from one system to another, there must be a lot of testing. You need to compare and see whether the figures uh, match. Now, they may not match, and if they do not match, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a mistake. Uh, you need to be able to explain why they do not match. And sometimes you may well find that the new, the, the new figures are actually more correct or more precise than, than the old figures, which you always thought were, were, were correct. So, the basic, uh, the, the, the basic advice here is how to be very, very carefully manage and the change management process is very important. Thank you. Uh, Andre? Okay. Uh, yes, I think uh, the coexistence coexist and the transition period, uh, they, they are very important. Uh, are, I think the, the most important consideration as the staff must be comfortable, must be comfortable with the, uh, with that, with the data that is coming out with the new system, and also confronting that with uh, with the old practices. Uh, of course, you would need to, in order to have a smooth process, you would need to feed both systems uh, for some time. Uh, it's important to always have in the back of their mind that uh, this time is not uh, is limited. You need to see to forecast uh, what is this. this trying to, to figure out what is the best transitional period. Otherwise, people will never get uh, used or will be kind of relaxing in dealing with the new system, which you designed. So here, in our experience, uh, <coughs> the biggest system that was dealing with domestic debt only, uh, we uh, coexisted for about one year. And the external debt, which has less instru instruments and less contracts, we coexisted for about three months only. So people were, were comfortable uh, with that. Uh, I totally agree uh, with Jose that uh, we must be very careful in migrating the data uh, to the new system and heads up. Mess, uh, you must uh, come up with, uh, you know, be very diligent when the time comes. Uh, but you also need to work also in the, con the cultural aspect of the team in order to get uh, used in dealing with the new practices, uh, which are much more, were much better uh, with, with, the, uh, with the control principles and also with the transparency. 
Thank you. Uh, so we are, we are actually wrapping up. So I will just close the session. Well, I would like to thank you very much for your patience today. We had a lot of technical issues. Renata, do you want to answer? Are you uh, available to answer the question? She doesn't hear, I think. She hears it. Okay. Okay, I will just close. Um, so thank you very much for your patience today. Um, and I would just like to announce, as I said, we are undertaking a survey about uh, what to expect from the debt management system, uh, the same topic we discussed today. As you see, there are several topics to, um, to uh, discuss upon, to um, debate, and there is no clear answer uh, because um, there are, I mean, they are not always comparable, the existing systems or the in-house systems and what to expect, etc. So we will share our survey uh, soon. Hopefully you will spend some time on uh, answering that and we will prepare a paper based on that. Uh, and I would like to uh, thank today my colleagues, Artan Ayazai and Zachary Austin Carmichael and Amira uh, for helping me organize this webinar. Also, I would like to thank the speakers for excellent presentations, excellent preparation, uh, Jose, Andre, and Renata. Uh, and thank you to all the participants for your good questions. We will share the questions with the uh, speakers and, um, and have more detailed answers. Uh, I think we covered most of the questions, but if there are some, and feel free to uh, share some more afterwards. So thank you very much. Uh, have a good morning, afternoon, and evening. Thank you very much. Andre and Joseph? Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, okay. Thank you very much. And I'm also available for questions if you want to get in touch later on, uh, either through the World Bank or directly.